I'd like to do is start our message, and let's go to Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. All right, Matthew chapter number 12. This morning, or today, I want to speak to you about the men against Jesus, the men against Jesus, and I think you'll find this very interesting. So Matthew chapter number 12, and I'll be there in a second with you. Matthew 12, I'm going to read one verse, verse number 14. It says here, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him, how to destroy him. Now, the aim of uh, this message and the one next week is to try to make it possible to understand the mind, the work, and the meaning of our Lord's life during his earthly sojourn. You know, the Apostle Paul has given us two scriptures concerning the mind of Christ. Uh, the first one is 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, and verse 16, uh, where it says, Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. And Paul there speaking of himself and Sosthenes, not to the Corinthians. Okay, it, it was for their sake that he was writing that. But then in Philippians chapter number 2, and verse number 5, let this mind be among you or in you that was in Christ Jesus. So I'm convinced that a, a study of the events that Jesus experienced during his earthly sojourn will aid in bringing us to an understanding of his mind work and his inner workings and if you just think of romans chapter number eight and verse 28 and 29 all things work together for good to them that what that love him they're called according to his purpose and those folks are determined to be conformed to the image of christ now i was trying to think of a simple illustration so you can uh, you can understand what i, I want to talk about here and i thought of my son joshua when Joshua was in uh, school up in uh, Roberts Wesleyan, he was a literature major and, and he wrote a lot of papers. Well, one of the papers that he wrote was concerning the hardest thing to do in sports. Now that seems like it would cover a vast <laughs> array of, of, of subjects because there's so many sports that people participate in, but actually he focused down to one thing and that one thing was this, how to hit a curveball in the sport of baseball. Now, in order to understand that, you have to do more than read about it. You have to experience that. In other words, when, if you're on a baseball field and someone is throwing a ball and it appears to be going towards your head, what's going to be your first reaction? Well, you're going to duck out of the way. But then the umpire raises his hand and says, strike one. And uh, by personal testimony, I'll, I'll say this to you. And that's that uh, I played baseball from the time I was eight years old all the way till I was 19 years old, just before I went into the, into the military. And I was a catcher. And I had a lot of good experiences. I mean, I got hit in the back of the head once with a bat. I got run over numerous times uh, trying to block the pay, plate when someone was trying to score. But one thing I could not do, and that was watch a ball come up my head and stand there. Well, my dad brought in a, a, a fellow that he worked with that played uh, minor league baseball, and he taught me how to do it. And the way he did it was he put three cinder blocks uh, around my uh, lead foot, that'd be my left foot, and then he told me, Dan, when that ball's coming at your head, just turn your shoulder into it. And if it doesn't break, it'll hit you in the shoulder. If it does break, well, it's a curveball. Well, I believe the same principle applies to our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and we don't often think of this. He was indeed <laughs> in the heavens with his Father. The Word was with Christ. But he became flesh. One of the reasons that he became flesh so he could experience life on this earth as a human being, as a, a, a man. You know, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And so when we see that, I think we have to realize that in our Lord's walk, even as a young man, when, when he was learning things, he, he was approved of by man and by God. So he was learning in, in the process of what it means to be um, an individual here on earth. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about here in terms of uh, men against Jesus. So it's difficult for me to understand 
the relentless hostility and hatred that certain people had toward our Lord. It, it's beyond my recognition. You know, if you go to John, or I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter number five, and you read the Beatitudes, you know, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, and you read those things, they're beautiful. Why would anybody be opposed to those teachings that, that he gave? But the opposition to Christ began very early in his ministry. Come over to Mark chapter 2 with me, please. Mark chapter number 2. And let's notice, please, two verses. And verse number 6 says, Now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts concerning what had just happened. All right, a paralytic was healed by the Lord. And they're questioning that. Instead of having a wonderment about it, there's questions in their mind about it. Then you come down to verse 16, and the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Have you ever wondered what they were opposed to here? Why was he eating with tax collectors and sinners? This is something I'd like to, to speak about this morning with you. Now, basically, what we find on the part of the scribes and Pharisees is suspicion and criticism of who our Lord is. So there were three groups that be, can be counted that were publicly opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ and his presence, now get a hold of this, on this earth. They didn't want him here at all. First group is the scribes and Pharisees. Second group is the Sadducees. And the third group were the chief priests. And each group had a different problem with Jesus. So let's look this week at the scribes and Pharisees. And then next Sunday, we'll look at the Sadducees and, and chief priests. Now, when we look at the scribes and Pharisees, we see that the, the opposition to Jesus is consistently connected with these scribes and Pharisees throughout the gospel accounts. And by the way, after the gospel accounts. Uh, we're in Mark. Let's turn over to uh, verse uh, chapter number three and notice, notice verse number six. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Herodians were a political outfit that were connected with Herod. All right. So, so immediately they wanted to destroy him just from the few things that they had heard and seen in his life. So the scribes and Pharisees are understood folks, only by, if you grab a hold of this, they're only understood by the Jewish concept of the law. And if you can't grab a hold of the Jewish concept of the law, you're not under, going to understand what the scribes and Pharisees were all about. So let's look at this if we can. Now, Judaism, all right, uh, in the law, used three different sense, senses. In other words, the word law had three meanings to them. Number one was the Ten Commandments, and that's a given. It was given to Moses on the mount. The second one was the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first uh, five books uh, of the Bible, and as we look at that, we understand that they were called roles by the Jews, but that's the second part. The third part is the part that really had the scribes and Pharisees in a tizzy about our Lord. For that's the scribal or oral law that they had developed over hundreds of years. Let me read you something. This comes from Mr. Barclay. He says, he says this, To the Jews there was nothing in this world so sacred as the law. The law, they said, is holy and has been given by God. They believed that the law had been created, hang on here, 2,000 years prior to creation. And they even believed that Adam had been created on the day before the Sabbath in order that he might begin life with an act of observance to the Sabbath law. They even went to the length of saying that God himself studied the law. The, there are 12 hours in a day, the saying ran, and during the first three, the Holy One, God, sits down and occupies himself with the law. It was believed that every single syllable and letter of the law was holy and divine, 
It was believed that the law contained the whole will of God, very important, fully and finally stated that nothing could be added to it or subtracted from it, and that there was no appeal against its ordinances or verdicts. Now, this is what the Jewish mindset was in relationship to the law as we see it. So with this then, we find the whole principle upon which the scribes and Pharisees thought and lived. Their whole lives revolved around the law. Therefore, if the law is the complete revelation uh, and will of God, it must contain everything necessary for man to live. Everything. So the law contains great principles, we know that. But this wasn't satisfactory in the hearts and minds of the scribes and the Pharisees. They thought there should be more to it. So they desired to find a series of rules and regulations which could govern every action possible and every situation that a person could go through in this life. So the scribes made it their business and their life's work to deduce from the great law, the Ten Commandments, if you please, these general principles that God had given. And what they did is they brought forth out of those ten principles the unending series of rules and regulations that would meet every situation in life. Now, this took over two centuries to do. So we're talking about 200 years. So they brought forth an infinitely or uh, 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 petty rules and regulations. Now, to the Jews, the oral law that they talked about was known as the scribal law or the tradition of the fathers or the tradition of the elders. They became more binding than the words of scriptures in Jewish life. So for many centuries, this mass of material, believe it or not, was never committed to writing. Wasn't done. In fact, it wasn't done till the third century after our Lord ascended into heaven when the scribes sat down and finally wrote it down. So I have a little screen we're going to put up for you. Uh, all right, it was called the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah was the oral law, and it was actually a summary of the oral law that the scribes had developed over the last 200 years. Now, in an English language, this would come out to about 800 pages. That's a lot of law, you say, 800 pages. Now, here's where the problem lies. The problem lies is that the Mishnah was not enough for the Jews. So there were commentaries that were written on the Mishnah, and they're called the Talmuds. You might have heard of those. The first one was called the Jerusalem Talmud, which was 12 volumes. The second one was the Babylonian Talmud, which was 60 volumes. Therefore, what we find is that Ten Commandments as given to Moses by God had turned into a library, which, by the way, is still not complete because they still add to it even in 2020. Let me give you an example of this so you'll understand what's, what I'm talking about. Let's go back to Exodus chapter number 20. Exodus chapter number 20, please. Let me get back there with you. Exodus chapter number 20, and let, let's look at verses 8 through 11. Chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. This is an example of what is written in the Talmuds. So we have, we have the Ten Commandments here, and this is God's Sabbath day. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters, your male servants or your female servants or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, what we find is this. This is a great principle that was given to the Jewish folks 
in relationship to a day of rest after six days labor. But the scribes and Pharisees didn't see it that way. They thought it should be divided up more and become a little more known to people on exactly what God wanted. So the Mishnah spends 24 chapters describing these few verses that we just read. 24 chapters. Now the Jerusalem Talmud has 64 and a half columns written on the Sabbath day, and the Babylonian Talmud has 156 pages written about uh, the Sabbath day. Now, how did all this work? Let me give you an illustration. The commandment says, no work on the Sabbath. That's what the commandment said there in Exodus 20. However, in the Mishnah, you have 39 headings called the fathers, the fathers of works. And actually what it's about, one of the 39 points it's about, is forbidden to carry burdens. And I just picked this one out. Say, Brother Dan, where'd you get all this information? Well, it's amazing what that little home button does on your phone if you hold it down. I don't know about your phone, but when I hold that down, my phone says, and it's printed out, how may I help you? And so when I ask my phone, I need information on the Mishnah. And then my phone tells me, I have 12 sources of information that you can go to to find the Mishnah. And it shows you Jewish writings, even Wikipedia and that sort of thing. So that's where I got all this information from. And you can do that at home yourself, okay? Just with a push, hold that button down for a moment and you can get that. Now, here's what happened. One of the 39 headings, concerning the, uh, the Sabbath day has to do with being forbidden to carry a burden. Thus the scribe says, what is a burden? Now in the Mishnah, definition after definition of what constitutes a burden is listed for us. I'll give you a couple examples. Milk enough for a gulp. Anything more than that is a burden. Honey to put on a sore, like a pimple. That's what you could carry, no more. Oil to anoint the smallest member of a person. And the person is defined as the little toe of a one day old baby. Water enough to rub off an eye plaster. Ink enough to write two letters of the alphabet. Anything heavier than two dried figs. And folks, it goes on and on and on. So the scribes worked out all the rules and regulations. It was, <laughs> and it was the lawyers, the Pharisees, who devoted their whole lives to keeping them. Now you might say, Dan, what is a Pharisee? Well, a Pharisee is an interpreter of the law or one that was separated to the interpretation of the law. And they believed that their duty was to keep these rules and these regulations. And by doing so, they were serving God. Now remember, we're not talking about the Ten Commandments, we're talking about the Mishnah and the Talmuds that the, that the scribes had put together. So uh, another little example, let me take a moment, in hand washing. And that's one of the things that the, the scribes and Pharisees accused the Lord's uh, disciples of not doing before they eat. But what they had to do was hold their hands up like this, all right, skyward, and water was poured on their fingertips and it rolled down to their wrists, you see. That was considered washing. And they take their fist and do the opposite hands palm in order to, to clean it. That was it. Now here's the wonder of it. I wonder how much water is contained in one and a half eggshells. Now, I didn't measure it, so I don't know. It couldn't be more than a few ounces, okay? A, a, a few ounces. But this was all the water they were allowed to use in their hand-washing ceremony. And then, when they were finished washing their hand, they had to rinse their hands, so they turned their hands upside down, if you please, and another egg and a half worth of water was poured down 
and that's what they considered washing their hands. There was none, none of this soap and water for 20 second business as we do it with the coronavirus business. So <laughs> the, it, what's interesting is, is to me, the Jewish religion then became a system of meticulous keeping of a mass of rules and regulations, which actually means that the Jewish religion folks became nothing more than externalism. That's all it was. It was law keeping. And more than anything else, what was wrong with it is that it became a source of pride. Come over to Luke with me, please, and chapter number 18. Luke chapter number 18. Let's look at a few verses here. All right, Luke 18, here we are. I want to begin reading in verse number 9, and we'll go down to about verse 14. 9 says this, He also told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So we're talking about the Pharisees who, thought, who were full of pride because they thought they were righteous, but other people with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord's words in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So when we're talking about the Pharisees, we're talking about this is the attitude that they had. They weren't like the regular everyday people. They thought they were special. And by the way, they were an elite group. There was never more than 6,000 Pharisees within Israel itself. So that's something for you to understand. So the scribes and Pharisees then, they continually uh, clashed with Jesus on three main points, and this is, this is actually what the message is about. Let me give you these main points. The first objection of the scribes and Pharisees concerning Jesus was this, that Jesus had never been to a rabbinical college. He was not educated by the Pharisees. He was not a trained scribe or a professional rabbi, although men called him rabbi because he was a teacher. He was a mere layman in their eyes. He was a carpenter from Nazareth. So therefore, what right does this man from Nazareth have to teach us anything? That's their attitude. Come over to John chapter 7. I have just a couple verses I'd like to share with you. John chapter 7, please, concerning this point. John 7, let's notice verse number 15 where it says this, the Jews therefore marveled saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Never studied with us, you see. That's the whole point there. Then I come back to Mark and chapter number one. Flip right over there with me. Mark chapter number one. And let's notice verse number 27. Mark 1, 27. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? This is after he commanded an unclean spirit to come out of someone. And up in verse number 22, it says they were astonished at his teaching. Well, why were they astonished? Because he wasn't trained in their schools. He was just from Nazareth up in Galilee, say. So they didn't understand this. Uh, Mark chapter 6, as long as we're in Mark. Turn over to Mark chapter 6. Okay, Mark 6. And let's notice, please, verses 1 through 5. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on a Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? 
How are such mighty works done by his hands? These are all questions they're asking. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. So just to summarize this, this thought of him not being part of their school or educational system, the scribes and Pharisees were horrified and scandalized and insulted that their territory should be invaded by an order or ordinary untrained commoner that was nothing more than a carpenter. So in their minds, what right did he have to teach anything at all? That's the first objection they had toward him. The second one is actually worse than the first, believe it or not. In view of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus was a deliberate breaker of the Sabbatical law. Come on back to Matthew one more time, or I'm sorry, Mark one more time. That's where I am. Mark chapter 1. And let's pick it up in verse 21. Mark 1, 21. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as a scribe. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves. And we just read this verse. What is this? A new teaching with authority? And he commanded even the unclean spirits, and they obeyed him. So what you're going to find is we, as we come down to verse number 28, which is very interesting. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. Now, do we know where Galilee is geographically in relationship to Jerusalem? Well, it's north. It's above Samaria, actually. It's not connected with Judea at all. And most of the scribes hung out down in, scribes and Pharisees, I should say, they hung out and ministered in Jerusalem and that area just outside of Jerusalem. So how did they know about his fame spreading everywhere? Well, I would submit to you that this is a great verse for espionage developing in the life of Israel. So what we have is the scribes and Pharisees sending out spies to watch him and his ministry. Uh, flip over to chapter 2 here of Mark, and let's pick it up in verse 23. Again, I'm just giving you a touch of the verses. Verse 23, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, and why would the Pharisees be in the grain field with, with the Lord's disciples? But, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to him, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? And he, and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of uh, Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, here's what's interesting about this. If you go back, and I'm not going to turn there, but you can write it down if you're keeping notes. Deuteronomy 20, uh, 23 and verse 25 say that on a Sabbath, you're allowed to pick an ear of corn or grain, say, on the Sabbath day. You can do that. But the Jews with the Mishnah saw that the Lord and his crew here, his disciples, broke four of the scribal Sabbath laws. Number one, what they do, the plucking is equated to reaping. And Deuteronomy 23, 25 says you cannot use a sickle to reap, just your hand. 
but the but the, the the scribes and Pharisees went further and said you 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 can't reap at all. You can't pluck it at all. The second thing is to separate the husks, the corn from the husk was what they called winnowing. You remember the winnowing places where they put the grain, you know, and 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 divide the the seeds from the from the husk. So they said just just to take the husk off would be winnowing. And then number three, to rub the grain between the palms was to grind it. And it did no such thing. God's law did not forbid that. But the Mishnah did forbid that. So the whole procedure that we see right here with the Lord and his disciples was to prepare food on the Sabbath in the eyes of the scribes and the Pharisees. And so they thought that was breaking the Sabbatical law. So then Jesus begins to heal on the Sabbath. Uh, how about Mark chapter 3? Let's notice the first six verses. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm or save life or kill? Now, to them, to the Pharisees. But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Now notice the reaction of the Pharisees. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to do what? How to destroy him. Say, how to destroy him. War was now declared on the part of the scribes and Pharisees toward Jesus. So the scribes and Pharisees were there to watch Jesus as he deliberately broke their Sabbath laws, not his father's Sabbath laws, but the scribes and Pharisees' law. So he continued this practice. Let me give you just two illustrations back in the book of Luke. Let's go to Luke 13. Okay, Luke chapter 13. And verses 11 through 17, if you would. Luke 13, 11 through 17. It says here, And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which the work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan or the adversary bound for 18 years be loosed from this bond on a Sabbath day. And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. Another illustration. Uh, you can go to verse uh, chapter 14 and notice the first six, uh, six verses. Um, Tell you what, let's pick it up in verse number five, because this is on the same subject. Uh, verse three says, And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent, so they had no answer for him. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. In verse five, and he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. To the very common things and common sense things of life, these scribes and Pharisees had no answer because they weren't of the common people. And I believe they had no common sense. Say, no common sense. So Jesus' point of view, folks, is this, that he believed humans take precedence over any ritual rule or regulation. And I think we need to understand that. 
And you see it here in Luke uh, 13, 15, and in 14, 5. He put people before regulations. Did the regulations come from God? No, they didn't. Our God is a, a very practical God. They came from men. So the scribes and Pharisees, folks, saw religion as keeping rules and regulations, wherein our Lord Jesus Christ saw uh, 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 religion in terms of love to God and love to man. So that brings us to the third problem, the third problem. The scribes and the Pharisees believe that Jesus' attitude, and I think this is the worst one, that his attitude towards sinful men and women was shocking and in their minds, incomprehensible. They could not believe it. Not at all. Come back to Matthew. Uh, I have a list of about 10 verses, but I'll give you a couple here. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, please. Matthew chapter 11. Just so you get the point. And remember why I'm doing this. Jesus had to come to this earth and interact with people so he knew exactly what people were. He didn't sit in the heavens, you see, and just look at them. No, he came to live among them to experience what, what they experienced. So when I come over here to, uh, what I say, Matthew chapter number 11, notice please verse number 19, 11, 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. So they perceived him, that, that, that fellowshipping with <laughs> tax collectors and sinners equated him to a glutton and a drunkard, okay? So if I come back to chapter 9, please, of the same book, Matthew, chapter number 9, notice with me verses 10 and 11. Matthew 9, 10 and 11. And as Jesus reclined a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why, do your, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. Now the Lord had a great answer to that. Pharisees had no answer to it. But verse 12 says, when they heard it, they, he, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are what? Those who are sick. So I'm going to flip over to Luke chapter 5, and I have many other verses here that we can look at, but I, I don't think it's necessary. You can follow along in your concordance if you'd like. Uh, Luke chapter 5, please. Luke chapter 5. Here we go. And I'd like to read to you verses 7 and 10. Concerning the common man and concerning sinners and tax collectors, prostitutes, everyone else that our Lord Jesus Christ hung around with and ministered to. Watch what it says here in Luke 5 and verse number 7. They signaled to their partners and to the other, other boat to come and help them. And they began and filled uh, both boats so that they began to sink. I think I might have the wrong, wrong verse here. Uh, let's see. I do. This, this has, oh, here's what it has to do with. Verse number 10. So they're out fishing. The Lord tells them what to do. And they gather all these fish. And it's, it's in two boats, if, if, if you please. But in verse 10, it says, and so also were James and John and sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So they're all together. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. So this was our Lord's ministry. He came to seek and save that which was lost, you see. And the Pharisees couldn't get a hold of this point. See, in our Lord's heart and mind, and he even quotes and says, hey, in the, in the presence of the angels in heaven, there's joy when just one, one comes to the truth. Where in fact the Pharisees, and this is a quote that comes out of uh, um, uh, the social life of Israel during the, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. I got five volumes of it. It says, there is joy before God when those who provoke him perish from the world. 
That was the scribes and Pharisees' attitude. Say, just the opposite of Jesus' attitude. So what attitude could the scribes and Pharisees have toward their fellow men? Well, they thought they were all unclean. And they wanted nothing to do with them. So the Pharisees narrowed then the love of God until it got to the place where they perceived that the only one that God loved were the scribes and Pharisees. Sad situation, isn't it? Jesus came, and what did he do? He widened the love of God until it reached out to all men, saints and sinners alike. So this was the third reason why the scribes and Pharisees wanted to destroy him. He came and turned their whole system of religion up side down. So, <clears throat> was the sinner <laughs> to be saved at all costs or be destroyed? And of course, what do we know? That he came to give his life for all mankind. But the Pharisees had no such idea at all. Mr. Barclay, again, I'm going to uh, quote him. He says, the inevitable conclusion of the Pharisaic mind was that Jesus himself was like the company whom he sought out, and that he was making light of and even encouraging sin. Once again, he seemed to them an evil moral influence, an undoer of the work of God, a character so dangerous to true religion and all the true religion stood for that he must be immediately eliminated before he could do any more harm. That was their attitude toward Jesus and his ministry to the Jewish people. Now I want to go to one more place, and that's in Romans chapter number 10. Come on over there with me. And we'll see if we can make this practical to us. Romans chapter number 10, please. Okay. I'm going to read just one verse. And of course, this is Paul speaking, and I can read two verses, one and two. Brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for them, for Israel, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to what? Knowledge. A zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Therefore, the Pharisees, folks, in their misplaced zeal for God, were to determine to eliminate the Son of God, to remove him from this earth. Now, next week, I'm going to look at the Sadducees and the chief priests. They had the same desire, but for different reasons. So to me, it's a wonderment. Now, I want to ask you a personal question. In your walk in this life, where do your spiritual problems come from? And I'm going to say that uh, uh, apart from your own heart and mind uh, and, and dealing with things, where do most of your problems come from? I'm going to submit to you, at least in my life, my problems don't come from the unsaved world. My problems come from the religious world. I had the privilege yesterday of speaking uh, with a lady from Tennessee who told us that, you know, Brother Dan, I remember all those things you taught us about rightly dividing, et cetera, et cetera. And she had five questions that she needed uh, answered. So we, we you know, had a predetermined time that she would call, and Susan and I spoke with her for about an hour and some. But she says, you know, I try to share these things with my brothers and sisters down here where I am and in the ministry we're in, and they don't do anything but shut me off. And I would submit to you that is the norm, folks. And the closer you grow to God in relationship through our Lord Jesus Christ and the work of his spirit in you through the word of God, you're going to find that most of your problems are going to come from the religious crowd and not from the world. I mean, you might give the gospel to somebody and they might say, oh, you're crazy. I don't believe it. And that'll be the end of it. 
But if you give something new to a believer who's never heard it and they're unwilling to even look at it, they're always going to remember you for, hey, that's a heretic. She's crazy. He's crazy. See? So when I look at the life of Jesus experiencing, if you please, in my little illustration, the curveballs of life, it's no wonder to me that it's the religious crowd that wants to do away with them, not the unsaved people. I think they were appreciative. They were fed by him and other things, healed by him. But the religious crowd just couldn't get in their heart that they were not indeed in a relationship with God the Father who gave the law that they perverted. So they believed that they'd have to rid themselves of this man, get rid of him. And I want to remind you of something. How old was he when he went to the cross? He was just 33 years old, maybe a couple of months older than that. He was a very young man. Most of these Pharisees, you couldn't become a Pharisee till you were 30 years old. So I'm assuming that many of the Pharisees were probably in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s if they lived that long then. But they had no connection with God. Therefore, they have to destroy him. So when we talk about men against God, the first group, men against Jesus, the first group is the scribes and the Pharisees. So thank you for listening. Let's sing another song.